All right, tonight we are going to do something a little bit different. We are going to dig into and discover the depth of the Hebrew alphabet. We have, uh, on Monday nights, we have been uh, digging deep into the alphabet, the Aleph Beit of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, discovering the letters in each letter and what it means and its numerical value and how it relates to us. And so I just felt uh, just really a, an inner call this week to, um, to share a little bit about what we've been learning on Monday nights and maybe go into a little bit more uh, detail. And so if you will open up your, your notes, you're going to want to take notes, you're going to learn some things you've never learned before, but uh, more than anything, we're going to draw closer to the Father because we're going to learn His language. Amen? All right, so I'm going to show you a little bit uh, as we get started. This is the original Paleo-Hebrew in pictograph format. Uh, we're going to learn all kinds of stuff this evening. But this is the original form of what the Hebrew letters look like. And this is 4,000 years ago. Over 3,000, between 3,000 and 5,000, 6,000 years ago, this is what language looked like in Hebrew. We have these inscribed on stones and different things that we have discovered in the land of Israel. And so this is just kind of give you a quick overview of what it looks like. We will be going through uh, two of these letters this evening. This is the modern day, uh, or Asherit. This is the modern day Hebrew language. Most of you are familiar with seeing some of the characters uh, in your Bible. It looks very similar to Aramaic. They both have the same square script. And uh, so we're going to be going through both Aleph and Beit this evening. And I want to whet your taste buds. For those of you that might not be familiar with Hebrew at all, or have ever taken a class, or ever really looked at it, and, you, and it just looks like Greek to you, I can assure you it's not. It's Hebrew, okay? <laughs> but... Uh, but I can tell you that I, I, I'm tell, when I began to go through and learn Hebrew, it has changed my life. It has literally changed the way that I look at scriptures. It changes the way that I study. I have far more respect now for those that have gone before me and, uh, and even teach Hebrew. Uh, and they've been, Brad, has, Brad Scott's been telling us for years, you know, he wants us to fall in love with the Hebrew language because once you fall in love, there's no turning back. Just look to your spouse on your right or your left, and you know, once you fall in love, there's no going back. And so I have fallen in love with this language, and I'm going to share with you just a little bit of why as we learn uh, some things about his words. Now, how many believe that God is an amazing God? How many believe that every word in your Bible is there for a reason? How many believe that every letter is there for a reason? And how many believe that every letter has a message built into it? Well, you're going to see messages built into these letters because it's more than just saying the letter Aleph is pronounced Aleph. When you begin to see the depth, you're going, you're the creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and your mind is going to go from here to off the charts when you see the depth that he has put into, the thought process that he has put into each letter. I mean, I'm blown away just at how a human being works. I'm blown away that, that my brain works most of the time when I'm sleeping. Some people say it doesn't work much when I'm awake, but in any case, uh, no. But seriously, it is incredible how the human body works, is it? And just that alone, it overwhelms me that God is that big. But then to open up just his language, that he created this amazing body, you and all of humanity and all of this earth, by these letters that we're going to go through here this evening, these letters is what he created the universe. So when we say, well, why is Hebrew important? Because he created the universe with these letters. That's why this is important. So let's get going. Why study Hebrew? Number one, if you married a foreign woman, how long would it take before you got completely bored of talking to her through a third person? About three and a half minutes as you want to go on a private date and you have to bring a translator with you because you have no idea what she's saying. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that is what we have been doing for 2,000 years with the Word of God. As we have a, a beautiful, amazing spouse that wants to talk to us and we have to go through a third party in order to understand. Is this making sense? Yeah, so now, do you think that it's possible that something could be missed in the translation, anybody ever watch like the UN whenever they do their like, 
you know, I'm one of those geeks that likes to watch some of that stuff every once in a while. And, you know, everybody has on those little earpieces, right? Everybody has on the You know that half of them are listening to the baseball game anyway. But when, when they're up there and they're speaking their foreign language, have you ever wondered why when they speak it, you know, the, the, like the person will say, blah, 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 blah. And, like, the translation's like two minutes long. Like, how could the translation be two minutes long? He just said blah, blah, blah. Most politicians, that's all they say anyway. But in any case, and sometimes it's a reverse. Sometimes they'll have this really long thing, and the translator will say, and I'm coming back next week. Now, how can it possibly be? So let me ask you a question. Do you think that it's possible that things can get lost in translation? Absolutely. And so I'm going to throw some things out that may stretch some of you. Maybe you're watching for the first time. And this is going to stretch you because I'm going to make some statements that might be controversial. But you cannot pick up your Bible and read it like a newspaper. You cannot pick up your Bible and read it like some, you know, Steven Spielberg novel. You can't, I mean, you know, you can't, you can't, it's not like watching a movie. It's not passive. The Bible is not meant to be read. Never one time from Genesis to Revelation will you ever have the Creator command you to read His Word. He says, study. So you don't study the newspaper. You don't study a book. You study His Word. Why? Because when you study His Word, His letters, you are studying Him. Is this making sense? It's like sitting across from your fiancé. We have several people getting married in the next couple of weeks. It's like sitting across from your fiancé before you got married and gazing into their eyes and hanging on every word that they said. We don't do that because we've all been taught to read the Bible. And amazingly, Yahweh is so big and so creative and so full of mercy and grace that He actually lets us get something out of it even when we read it like a newspaper. But it's not meant, ladies and gentlemen, to read as a sleeping pill before you go to bed. It's not meant just to say, I had a quiet time. He wants to know you, and you can't get to know Him fully. Now, this is, might be controversial, but deal with it. You cannot know the living God intimately, the way that He has designed it, without talking to Him with His language. You cannot know what He truly means in His Word without knowing His Word. You can read it in English, but I can promise you, as you're going to learn tonight, you will never know the Creator on the depth and level that He originally designed until you speak to Him face to face, knowing His words, the way that He wrote them. Now you might, Jim, are you saying that you can't understand the Bible without understanding Hebrew? No. I'm saying, make it clear so that I can reduce the amount of emails that I get this week. You cannot know the depth of what he's trying to say without knowing what he said in his original language. Just like you cannot have the depth of intimacy. Yes, you can have an intimate relationship with your wife if you had a translator there. Yes, you could understand what she's saying to a degree. But there are certain words in every language that cannot be translated. So what is the translator going to do? Haven't you ever seen a translator when the person is talking They will like pause. Why are they pausing? They should be streaming the interpretation. I know, I have a friend of mine that's a professional translator uh, in Spanish. And several times, you know, he has the capability, and there's a difference between being able to speak the language and being able to translate. Translators can stream it as they hear it in their ear, they can stream it. But oftentimes, they have to stop. Why? Because their brain gets in the way because what they just heard in Spanish, there is no English word for So what that translator is going to do is input another word as close as he possibly can so that the person that's receiving can understand, knowing that there's no way for him to completely understand what this person just said. So what I want to do is hopefully uh, tantalize you this evening to to, uh, goad some of you to study this beautiful language. Because when you see His language, the way it was written, and the depth of it, there's no turning back. 
Hebrew is the foundational language of the Bible in all of the apostles. In the day, the first century, Aramaic was spoken, Hebrew was spoken as the, as the spiritual language, and Greek was spoken as the, as the language of commerce, the language of Rome. But Hebrew is the language of the Bible. You can sparsely understand what he is trying to say without speaking his language. Let's talk about a few word plays before we actually get into a couple letters. Genesis 2.19, watch this. Out of the ground, Hebrew word there is Adama. The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So instantly, in English, if I did not put that Hebrew word in there, you're looking at, you see no connection whatsoever, do you? You see ground and you see Adam. Where's the phonetic connection? There is none. But in the original Hebrew, we see something very intriguing. You don't even have to be smart. You can be a five-year-old that speaks Hebrew, that reads Hebrew, and you're going to immediately see that there's a connection between two words. In, the first, in verse 19 of chapter 2, you're going to see that ground and Adam are coming from the same root word. Adam and Adama. Adam was formed from the ground. There's a connection. So we have a deeper connection because you have a root word that is similar. One comes from another. Here we go. Here we go. Heidi ho, Heidi ho. Adama. Let's break down Adama and see exactly what we have. First of all, if you take the Aleph and the Dot and the Dalit, you have Ad, okay, which means vapor. So these are the words that are found inside of just Adama, ground. You have Dalit and Mem. That is blood. And you have Adam, which is man. So inside of Adama, you have vapor, which is connected to ruach or wind, blood, and man. Man full of blood with the vapor or the ruach of Yahweh that came from the ground. All within one single word. This is Av. How many have heard of Av? This is the Hebrew word for father. Okay? Father is Av. It can also be, a, a bait can be pronounced a ba, depending on whether or not there is a, a little dot in the middle of the bait there. So you have, on the right hand side is the letter Aleph, on the left hand side is bait. First two letters of the Hebrew alphabet that we're going to talk about this evening. This is father. I'm going to come back to this because. Father is an incredibly abstract word. What does it mean? I'm from planet X. Coming soon to a theater near you, <laughs> some say. But what is father? I'm, I'm here for the first time, I, and I hear this word father. I have no idea what father means, because the word father means nothing. It's Greek. It's abstract. There's no way that you can know what father means unless someone explains it to you. You connect me with me? You can't know what it means just by the word father. We all know what it means because we all have one. But in Hebrew, let's discover what this word really means when they're reading it 3,000 years ago. This is the original pictograph of these first two letters that we're going to discuss this evening. One looks like what on the right? Looks like an ox head. One on the left is the letter bait. So the one on the right is Aleph. The one on the left is bait. Looks like a house or a tent is really what, what the original meaning was. And so the first one, you have the strength. Aleph means strength or leader. We're going to break this down in a little detail later. And bait is really house or tent. So really, father is the tent pole or foundation. Because what is the strength of the house? A foundation. What's the strength of the tent? You know, some of us are going to be, you know, celebrating Sukkot here very soon. We're going to be living in sukkahs or tents or campers, whatever. But what is the strength, your strength of your tent? You know, you pull out your tent and it's just nothing. It's just a fabric. 
it only becomes a tent that is inhabitable when the poles hold it up. That pole is Av, or what we say, Abba in Aramaic, the Father, okay? The Father is the one who is the foundation. He is the tent pole that holds up the tent. Isn't that cool? So now in Hebrew, when they read this, they go, the strength of the house, that's a father. A father is a million things. Today, a father is someone that progenates a child. But in Bible language, a father is a strength of the house. And the next thing you know, if you know Bible, you know what house they're talking about. Because there's only one house in all of the Bible. And that's the temple. So now we have a connection that the strength or the leader of the house is the leader of the temple. And now the Hebrew mind is going to go, what's in the temple? Instructions, and it's all connecting. You see how that works? It's beautiful language because when you know it and you see the pictures, you, your mind goes in a million directions because it never ends, the connections. Father today, I have a son. You're a father. Not in Bible days. A father is one who is the leader of the house of God. Today we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we serve our Father who dwells where? In the house. It's pretty amazing. All right, so here we go. Aleph, let's begin with the, with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. On your right, like I said, is the pictograph form. I'm going to show this a million times so that you can begin to soak it in because you're going to see it in your Bibles. You may not know what the other 21 letters are, but by the time that we're done here this evening, uh, well, you'll, you'll have two of the 22. So you may not know the other 20, but every time you see Aleph and Bait, you're going to know exactly what they mean. The people that have been in my class for the last, I don't know how many weeks it's been, they are beginning to read Hebrew. Now, they don't know what it means, but they've learned to read it just by learning the letters. Go figure. That's what our five-year-olds do. They learn the alphabet, then they learn to pronounce it, and it comes naturally. This is the, uh, the uh, morphology of the word, how it's morphed from 4,000 years ago in pictograph format to 3,000 years ago to Kitav Ivri, which is Paleo-Hebrew. Ivri is, uh, is Hebrew, so Paleo-Hebrew is the stick form of the, of the ox or the strength. And that form was used from about 10, excuse me, 100, let me back up here, 1000 BC all the way to the time of the Messiah. And it phased out after the Babylonian exile, after they came back uh, from Babylon, the Katav Ashrit came into style. So by the time Yeshua was walking this earth, what, you, what he saw, what he read, was the Katav Ashrit. Today in modern uh, Hebrew is the book type. Very similar. So what we see today is very similar to what Yeshua would have uh, uh, written or seen on the scrolls. And unless he was pulling from, from something that might even have been older, they might have had the Ivri, the Paleo-Hebrew involved there. Okay? So just a quick history lesson. When I show those charts, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking at. Aleph. When you spell Aleph out, okay, it's not just a letter. When you spell it out, it's Aleph, Lamed, and Pe. Aleph, Lamed, and Pe. And Pe can be pronounced as an F as well. I'm not going to go through those letters, but I wanted to show you this because what it means is the strength, Lamed is a staff or instructions, and Pe is a mouth. So what Aleph really means is the strength of the instructions of the word, of the mouth, or the word. And what do we know instructions is in Hebrew is Torah. So it could be actually read, the strength of the Torah is the word. Isn't that amazing? The first letter of, 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 the, of the universe is the strength of the Torah is the word. And out of the word came all of the universe. It has to have something to do with the word. It's the first letter. Morphology, the letter Aleph morphed into the Greek and then what you see is the letter A in Latin. That's where we get the letter A from. Okay? The alpha in Greek, the letter A in Latin that became the English A. Amazingly, all three, the, the, the Latin, the English, and the Greek all came from Hebrew. And you'll see that. Its sound is A or A, 
is the letter Aleph, is A or A, and its numerical value is one. So every, for some of you that don't know this, every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a number and a picture attached to it. It has a meaning, and it has a number. And it starts with one. Aleph is one, Bet is two, so on and so forth, until you get to the letter Yod, which is 10, and then it jumps to 20, 30, 40, 50. And if you stay with me as we move through this class, you'll begin to understand the incredibleness as you begin to connect meanings, pictures, and numbers together. You have a beautiful uh, collage. The word Aleph, when you add up its numerical value, go figure, it's 111. It's the first. It's the beginning. It's 111. If you add Aleph, Lamed, and pay together, you come up with 111. The meaning of the number one. Just so you know what the numerical meaning in, in biblical terminology, it's the number of God. It's the number of Yahweh. Why? Because He is a God. He is one. That is the Shema. It means unity. It cannot be divided. The Aleph cannot be divided. It's the very first letter. It cannot be divided. It will always be one. It's the beginning. The number one means beginning. Eight is new beginnings. One is beginning. Makes sense. It's the beginning of numbers. It's unique. Number one is unique. There is nothing else so that it's unique. It's by itself. And it's completeness. It's perfect. There's nothing else to even show. Matter of fact, if you're the only person on planet Earth, you're perfect. There's nothing to compare it to. Whether you are, are, are large, or whether you're small, or whether you have no hair, or lots of hair, it wouldn't matter if you're the only person on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. You're complete, perfect, and unique. The meaning of Aleph is ox, strength, power, or leader. So when you see the Aleph in your Bible, what you're seeing is the strength, or the power, or leader. Okay, the strength of a leader, really. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We all have heard that. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et haaretz. That's what it is in Hebrew. Now, what I want to show you something is pretty incredible. You can't see it in the English. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that makes sense. He created the heavens and the earth. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It's much more specific, and there's something that the sages have been looking at under mystery for thousands of years. And that is this. It says, actually in Hebrew, right before heavens and the earth, there is a two-letter word that cannot be translated. And it is not translated in any translation because it's impossible to be translated. And it says, in the beginning, God created et. Et, in Hebrew, is untranslatable. It means the direct object is next. In other words, in Hebrew, when you come across the word et, what you are seeing, it's telling you is pay attention, the next word is the focus. The next phrase or the next focus, the next word or phrase is what I'm focusing on. It's the direct object of the sentence. How many grew up diagramming sentences? It is so not fair that kids don't even know what that is today. Because all of us were tortured with the, the lines and the slants and the preposition came down. It was like this tree. And even back then when I was in fifth grade, I said, what is the point of diagramming a sentence? To take up more time. I'm convinced. Kids today know what subjects are without a diagramming sentence. So, so but remember that the, the, the slanted line always told you that next is the direct object when you diagram a sentence. That's what et is. But watch what it means in Hebrew. Et is Aleph Tav. So in the beginning, God created, or the word created in Hebrew can be brought forth or revealed. Just like you have a baby. Created, brought forth, revealed something that was hidden. It's in the womb for nine months. You have no idea really what's in there. You've never seen it. And in ancient days, they didn't have you know, the, all the electronic equipment so you could peek inside electronically and see what they look like. Today, it's so advanced that, I mean, why even come out? We, have, we know exactly what they look like. They even have color photographs. You already know whether they have hair, whether they've got fat cheeks, or they're skinny. I mean, it's amazing. Back then, you didn't know. It's completely revealed and hidden until it's brought forth. In the beginning, God brought forth the Aleph 
and the tov. Do you know what aleph and tov is? For those of you that are completely, you know, illiterate of the, of the Hebrew language, it's the first letter and the last letter of the Hebrew language. In the beginning, he created the alphabet. He created all things to create all things. Let me say that again. In the beginning, he brought forth his words. Because before you create, you have to have words. Before you have words, what do you have to have? You have to have letters. He created the alphabet. Now, let's see if this actually has any connection to something you might be familiar with. Revelation chapter 1 says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says Adonai, who is and who was and who was and who is to come. Zavaot Almighty. We sang that tonight. I didn't know we were going to sing that tonight. But let me ask you a question. It says in here, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. This is Greek. Do you really think that our Lord in the, in the moment here of the kingdom at the millennium, after creating the Hebrew language that created the entire universe, would stand before the universe and say, I am the, Allah, the uh, Alpha and the Omega. I am the Greek alphabet. He's not Zeus. He's not a Greek god. He's a Hebrew God. He's Elohim. He would not have said, I am the, Al the Alpha and the Omega. I can't even say it. He would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am everything that my Father has created. I am that language. I am all of the words. I am the word. Let's continue and see if we see any more connections. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, the Melech of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh Sevaot, as we read it tonight, we sang tonight. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no Elohim. This is Yahweh, ladies and gentlemen, speaking this. For those of you that struggle, and I know with talking to thousands of people online, there are somebody out there is going to struggle with whether or not Yeshua himself is divine. We have a big problem if he's not. And I don't mean to get into that theology, but right here in Isaiah, Yahweh says, and he's the king of Israel, Yeshua is called the king of Israel, and his redeemer, Yahweh Sevaot, the one who is the warrior, the mighty king. I am the first and the last. There is no other Elohim. Yeshua in Revelation 1.8 says, I am the first and the last. That's a problem. If you believe that Yeshua is just a man, if he's just a prophet, he cannot claim the same thing that Yahweh claims as being the first and the last, the very beginning and the very end. Is this making any kind of sense? Let's continue. In the beginning again, let's see if there's any connection. Where, where is there in your Bible another place where it says in the beginning? Absolutely. Isn't that incredible? Do you think that maybe John, the most Jewish of all the apostles, is thinking at all when he wrote that? I mean, listen, this is a guy who grew up with what they call the scriptures, the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, where in the, it starts out in the beginning. So when John pens this letter, that is going through his head. He's not making this up. It's going through his mind when he says, in the beginning. He's connecting something. Let's see what he connects. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was Elohim. In the beginning, God brought forth the Aleph and the Tav. I believe that John, when he says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word you know, became, and then verse 14, it says the word became flesh. John knows in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says in the beginning, Elohim created or brought forth the Aleph and the Tav, and in Isaiah and Revelation, both Yahweh and Yahweh's right arm claim to be that Aleph Tav. You see the connection. That word is not there in Genesis 1-1 for no reason. Isaiah and Revelation both say that Yeshua and Yahweh, the arm and the body, if you will, claiming to be the Aleph and the Tav, what it is in Hebrew, it's the power or the strength of the leader of the covenant. Because Tav, is, its pictograph is a cross or a mark, and it means covenant. So in the beginning, God created the leader 
of the covenant. The leader and the strength of the covenant. So when Yeshua says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, what is he saying? I'm the leader of the covenant. I'm the strength of the covenant. The problem is we don't know what covenant he's talking about. Because we don't read the front of the book where the covenant is found. When we say new covenant, we need to discover what that is. What does it mean to have a new covenant? Does that mean the entire old is thrown out? If so, we need to get rid of all the Ten Commandments. It doesn't matter if if nine of them are found in the New Testament. Like they say, we need to get rid of all of them. Because you cannot get rid of a covenant and keep any part of it. Or can you? When I was a financial planner, I, I had contracts for people, and if you change one word in a contract, that makes the entire contract null and void. Ask any attorney. Now, I can rewrite the contract and keep every single word and just change the commission schedule. It becomes a brand new covenant. It's a brand new... Did I, did I, change, did I get rid of everything? No, I just changed one thing. Guess what was changed? The high priesthood. The high priesthood was changed. It made it a new covenant. Let's continue. Back to Aleph. This is cool. It's made up of two yodes and a diagonal vav. Well, you see the little small uh, stick-like letter on the right is called a vav, and the one below it looks like an apostrophe. That is a, a, uh, a yod. Remember when Yeshua said not one jot or tittle? What he really would have said is one yod or dagesh, okay? One yod. This is what he's talking about. Just one little, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, little apostrophe. It's made up of two of those, and you kind of see it. It kind of looks like an X in English. But on the top right, you have like a yod. And on the bottom, you have a yod. And in the middle, you have this diagonal va. There's big significance to this letter Aleph, because what's the first letter in your Bible? Bait, bare sheet, right? In the beginning. You would think if God was so smart, he would have started out with the first letter. That would have been kind of cool. Aleph. But Aleph, ladies and gentlemen, is a vowel. It's silent. And it means the strength and the power of the leader. And watch what it means when you connect these three letters together. Because really, it's the higher power. Because Yod is the right hand of power. It's the higher power that is separated from the lower power, which is us, by the nail. And the vav in Hebrew pictograph is a nail. It's something that connects. And so Yahweh is separated from us, but we're connected by the nail. Which nail? The nail of Yeshua. It's amazing how it all all comes together. So Aleph is the hidden letter. It is this letter. That is the letter Aleph. Aleph is the breathing in. Bait. Baruch, Bereshit, okay? The universe was created. Aleph is the breathing in. It is that silent level of power that separates and is getting ready to connect. That's what Aleph is. It's the strength of the leader. And who is the leader, we learned? The Father. Aleph words. Let's talk about some Aleph words that you might be familiar with. Uh Uh-oh. That's not supposed to happen. So now I'm not going to be able to... uh, Okay, so Elohim, I got a hint though, is God. This is totally backwards. How bizarre is this? All right. Av is father. Echad means one. These are Aleph words. I feel like I'm on on a quiz here. (laughs) I really do. How embarrassing. Ahava is love, I believe. And you don't know, so I'm right no matter what. (laughs) You really have a sense of humor. He says you should look at it more closely. All right. El is uh, God or deity. Aleph Lamed. Okay. And back to Elohim. Elohim really means plural majestic magistrate. It's the judge. Okay, when you see Elohim. Some more Aleph words. Or. Light. light. I knew it. I was the light right there. 
our or light or a met truth thank you i should know that passion for a met next a knee a knee i know this one a knee i This is not right. Aha. Uh -huh. Avraka. Avraham. A father of multitude, many nations is Abraham. Avraka, what is that? I will bless. Thank you. I will bless. No idea how the formatting got all messed up, but that's okay. This is great to be humiliated in front of 10,000 people. I don't know this one. Ashray. What's it say? Blessing. Adam. Adam. What can I say of a master's? Amuna. We're going to talk about this one one of these days. Amuna is faith. Okay? Amuna is faith, and faith does not mean what you think it means. In, in English, faith is so ambiguous, it's so like Greek. Amuna is a deep seated uh, belief that Yahweh causes everything. No reason to have anxiety, no reason to be upset. Because when the camera breaks, when the stream falls down, when everything happens, when the world falls apart, when a comet comes and the earth breaks in half, someday, when a third of the stars fall from heaven, it's Amuna. In other words, let his will be done. Because if you are righteous, according to the scriptures, every single step is ordained. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. You step out on the street and you get hit, it's emuna, meaning that he knew you were going to take that step and he did not prevent you from getting hit by a car. Therefore, it is his will. He's something to be blessed in the process. This word emuna, I could spend an hour on because emuna is the only word in the Hebrew alphabet that brings shalom. Shalom, peace. You cannot have peace in your life if you do not have faith. This is why James says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Because my shalom is not built into, because when we say shalom, what are we thinking? Shalom is kind of sitting back with our arms crossed, just kind of relaxing, got a soda in our hand, watching the ball game. That's shalom. That's peace. Shalom, according to the scriptures, is doing what the Creator asks you to do, knowing that everything that the results happen come from Him. So it doesn't matter. When you go to work, you are working for Him. When you give in the offering, you're giving to Him. Everything that you do, whether you speak to your spouse, whether you bless your children, it's amuna, and because the results are not yours. You know, I got in a conversation with somebody speaking of, of, of giving the offering, and, and uh, they were giving at their local congregation, and then they found out that the pastor had done something bad. I won't say what it is, but he got involved with some sin. And what did they do? They stopped giving. Now, I want to challenge that. I, mean, I would have done the same thing. But see, that is not a biblical concept because that means that you're giving to the man. That person was giving to the man, was never giving to God. Because you don't pull away your sheep from the kingdom because you don't like something that's said. Because you don't like the way somebody acted. Who are you to threaten God with what he's given you? Is this making sense? And unfortunately, this is what we do. We withhold what we have been commanded to give to forward his kingdom because we're in charge. Wait a minute. I thought the Levites, man, I mean, they were required to give 10%. They didn't care if the guy was a grouch when they brought their sheep. They still had to give it. It's not your problem when you give and it, that is misused, is it? Because you gave it to him. You gave it to him. Amuna 
is not concerned with the results. Amuna is concerned with just the action of serving. Adonai is the Lord. Adonai. Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yod. The strength of the leader that opens the door that brings life and power. That's what that word means. Bait. Let's move on to the letter bait. We'll cruise through this. We're running a little bit late this evening. Bait. Both, on the, both letters are bait. One is Paleo-Hebrew and pictograph, and one is the modern Hebrew. The morphology of bait looks like this. It's Gematria's letter, is, or numerical value is 2. And it moves all the way through, as you can see. It has the sound B, and it's where we get the word both from. The English word both, believe it or not, comes from the word bait. Why? When you say both, what are you saying? Two, right? Both of them, this one and this one. It comes from bait, which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You wouldn't believe how much of our lives are connected to the Hebrew language. You take the Hebrew language out, we have no language. Multiple languages of the world. Matter of fact, all of them. Has two different sounds. And you're in your Bible, if you're taking notes, for those of you that want a little more detail, it's pronounced B if it has a dagesh in it, a little a dot, and it's V if it does not have that dot in the center. So when you're reading it, that's what you're looking for if you have vowel points. If you don't have vowel points, then it's kind of like you have to, you have to know the language well enough to know the context. Bait, spelled out. Bait, yod, tav. I don't know if I go into what that means, but that is the house. Bait is house. Yod is power. Tav is covenant. It's the house of the power of the covenant. Makes perfect sense. The house of God is the power of the covenant. So here we go. Av means father. There you go. Aleph, bait, av. That's father. Watch this. What is son? Very good. Ben. Or Bain. Bait. Noon. A noon it looks a little different for those of you that know noon. It's a final noon. It looks more like a staff. It looks more like a, a staff, okay? So that's Ben. That's son. Now here's what's phenomenal. If you combine the word in Hebrew, Av and Ben, father and son, what you get is Aben, which means stone, foundation, or rock. That should mean something when Yeshua says, if you build your house on the rock, what did Yeshua say? I am the stone. The builders rejected. What is he saying in Hebrew? For th those that knew Hebrew, what, he's saying, I am the Aben. I am. I am before Abraham was. You see, it's all connected. I am the stone. The stone is I have the authority of the Father built into me, the Son. That makes a foundation cornerstone that you will stumble over because you won't be able to accept that, that I came from the Father. It's all connected. It's meaning. Let's go back to bait. It's meaning. It's a tent, house, floor plan, family, or to dwell in. So it's all things that have to do with a house. It can be a tent, an ancient, uh, he, an ancient Israelite, a house, the floor plan. Kind of looks like a floor plan a little bit. Or to dwell in. And they get to dwell in because of the arm that points into the house. We'll come back to that. Its numerical value is two, which means divided or showing a difference or can be testimony where two or three are gathered in my name. You could not bring a charge against the elder, an elder at any congregation in the world, at any point in history since the Torah was given, unless you had two witnesses. So in other words, if an elder did something wrong, and you couldn't prove it or had any kind of witness, it is not anything, you could not discipline that whatsoever. It had to be proven by a witness. You had to have a bait. You had to have a witness, two witnesses, to show a difference, to make a testimony. Torah says the testimony cannot stand unless there are at least witnesses. 
One plus one equals two. Isn't that amazing? Would you guys learn a passion for truth tonight? One plus one equals two. This is neat. Especially in the process of doing weddings, you cannot have a house with one. A house is one plus one equals bait. That is when you have a house. You can be a bachelor. You can have your own physical house. You see, in English, when we say house, we're thinking, you know, uh, walls and a roof and carpet and a television for sure. But in Hebrew, a house is one plus one. It's two people make a house. All you have to do is have a fig. All you have to do is have one sukkah, one small tent held up by the father as the pole, the foundation, the rock, and you have a house. Bait is connected to Exodus. How? Second book of the Bible. Aleph is connected to Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible. It's the first letter. Exodus is connected to bait. What's amazing is Exodus is all about the building of the house. Over 15 chapters in the book of Exodus are devoted to design and construction of Yahweh's house. And it ends with the glory filling the temple. Your house, my friends, are designed to do what? We've been building houses for 2,000 years now, however we want to build them. Oh, I want to build my house here. I'll build my house here. Prophetically, I'm, I'm talking figuratively about creeds and doctrines, and I'll believe this, and I'll do that, and I'll build my house. But Father says, Abba says, you know, you, you'll labor in vain if I don't build the house, if I don't build the bait. You'll labor in vain. So what has Yahweh been doing in these last days? He's tearing down the houses. Why? So that you rebuild them on the rock. You rebuild them on his house so that when you're done 15 chapters later constructing and devoting design to the house that he wants you to have and you do Bible things in Bible ways and you begin to keep the Shabbat and you begin to, to, to eat the things he says to eat and to not eat the things he doesn't say to eat and to celebrate the days that he says are important to him like anniversaries do for our spouses. When we get to do all of these things and more that please our Father, then the glory comes. Thank you for that faint amen. Until we clean up the house, the glory doesn't come. Now everyone, I've always grown up to believe that we can't do anything to get God's favor. Can I say something that's not kosher? Hogwash. Are you kidding me? No, we can't do anything for salvation. You can't earn your salvation. But after you get saved, ladies and gentlemen, it's just like after you get married. Try telling your wife there's nothing you can do to get her favor. I'm married to her. That should be all the favor she needs. <laughs> try that one, guys. I told her I loved her once. How many times do I have to tell her? You know? <laughs> Come on. Marriage and family is a picture of our relationship with Him. We are the bride, He is the bridegroom. If we want the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, and the glory of the Shekinah to come and to fill our temples, it must be clean. And I know this is stepping on some of you that are your first time here. You say, well, there's nothing. No, the blood of Yeshua causes you to be clean on judgment day. But if you want the glory of the Shekinah, the Father, to show up and to give you power in your life, you must live a holy life. Peter says to be holy because he is holy. Do you know where that he's quoting from? Leviticus chapter 11. What is Leviticus chapter 11, you asked? I'm glad you did ask. Leviticus 11 is the dietary laws of what is clean and unclean for what you put in your body. Now, do you think that the writer of, of Peter, of 1 Peter, is remotely thinking about the verse when he says, Be holy as I am holy? Why would he pull that from that particular scripture? That's where it's found. And it's talking about holiness connected to food? You don't make the rules, so quit complaining. You can't question the Creator 
and say, well, I don't think holiness has anything to do with food. You didn't write the word. See, on earth, whoever has the gold makes the rules. In heaven, whoever's holding heaven makes the rules. He holds the earth in the palm of his hand. No, I'm sorry. It says he holds the universe in the palm of his hand. He makes the rules. If he says, don't eat this, I'm sorry. Don't eat it. I don't care how good it tastes. You're not going to convince him on judgment day that a pig is, is okay. Because then you're saying that Yeshua, the Messiah, killed a herd of pigs that could have been used to feed the poor. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to eat anything that Yeshua cast demons into. Because if you think about it, those pigs, I can't believe I'm talking about food in this. This has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But I'll finish my thought. Pigs, if they were created for food, then Yeshua broke the Torah. Because we are not to waste food. You are to give it to the poor. And an entire herd of animals that could have fed half the poor in his city. Come on. He didn't break any Torah commandment because it's not food. It couldn't be given to anybody. We want to be filled with his glory. Here's some connections. 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 9 through 11 says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are Elohim's building. According to the grace of Elohim, which were given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, father, son, stone, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Yeshua the Messiah. There is your stone. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Ruach who is in you, whom you have from Elohim, and you are not your own? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and most of us know this that in this room, but I know with the size of the audience that are, that are listening to me, and even, even beyond that, that there are people that don't understand when that, when, in, in Jewish culture, in Hebrew culture, when you say that you do not know that you're the temple of the Ruach, he's pointing at it. The temple means clean and unclean. You have to be clean to come before Him. And we've created a maverick idea that, that we can do whatever we want. We can decide, oh, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to dress this way. You know, I'm going to give money this, to this person. I'm going to, I'm going to not give to this person. You, we're so in control of our lives. And Paul is trying to say, no, don't you realize you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? That means you fall under the covenant restrictions of what the temple says. Which means we better know what the temple is. If you're the temple of the Ruach, it's not just some Christianese phrase. I'm the temple. You know, like whatever that means, we better find out what that means. We better know and discover what the temple is and how it was treated in the first century if we want to know how it relates to us. Some bait words, and we'll finish with this. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Bait is house. Ben is son. Bana is... To build. Barak is to bless or to bend the knee. One day he will. Amen. Boker is to, um, I know this one, first watch, first, first light, yes, which is the first watch. First light is Boker. Boker is what? Morning. Makes sense. See the connection? Boker. Boker, morning, first watch. When I say Boker Tov, what am I saying? What is Tov? Good. Good morning, Boker Tov. So tomorrow morning, greet your spouse with, spouse with, with Boker Tov. Bain. Bain. Between. Or discern. 
Badal and Baka, I don't know these two. What are these? Come on, you Hebrew scholars. Read my PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you the pictograph of what it means. Badal is Beit, Dalad, and Lamed, which is the house of the door of instruction. So it's the house that opens the door to instruction. It'd be interesting to find out what Badal actually means. <laughs> to, to be divided? Is that what you said? Makes perfect sense. The house that opens the door to instruction. What does instruction do? It divides right and wrong, clean and unclean. What is baka? You looked at, somebody looked that one up for me. To cleave or to break open. To cleave or to break open. Connected to house. Here we go. Leader. In conclusion, here's what we got. Aleph and Beit means leader or strength. That's Aleph. And we have Beit, which is the house, the tent, or the family, okay, or to dwell in. And together, you have the strength of the house of the family is the Father. And that's who we're to pray to is our Father, who is the strength or the leader of our house. And what is your house? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we'll stop here tonight. Father, thank you so much for your words. We thank you for your, the letters built into your words. I pray that your word would go deep inside of our heart, that we would learn this beautiful language that will open up windows of opportunity to know you more. Father, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice that you would, you would bring all of us to our knees to surrender our ways our mind, our will, and our emotion, our souls, our nefesh. Father, I pray that as we bow the knee that you would lift us up with your grace and your mercy and you would teach us your ways. I pray that you would give us the instructions, the instructions of your house. And then you would build our house and that you may dwell in it. There is no power without your indwelling. So, Abba, I ask that you would dwell in your people. Do what you want to do with my life, with the lives of those that are in the sound of my voice in this entire ministry. We put it before you tonight and ask you to destroy it if that's what you want to do or, and build us into something that can be used to reach the nations. Whatever you want to do, Father, you are the potter. We are simply the clay. We lift your name up tonight, and everyone said, amen and amen.